evening. Good to see each of you. If you're willing to move on up to the front section, at least a little closer maybe, that, that's always helpful. When we're singing, we're going to be singing a good bit tonight. And there's a lot of people traveling, so we are thinner than usual tonight. So come on up as far as you are uncomfortable being. <laughs> and that would be great. Great. Appreciate you for staying solid in the second row. Appreciate it. It is good to see each of you this evening, and it's good to worship with you. We've learned two new songs this month. We're going to sing one of those again to begin tonight, Even Song, which JT taught us a couple of weeks ago. And then we're going to learn a, a, one more new song for the month uh, after we sing that one. Uh, then Matt Kelly is going to have some thoughts around a song, and Kendall Fudge will have thoughts around another song, and that will take up most of our uh, worship period this evening. Then we'll have a short break. So let's go ahead and sing Even Song together. <clears throat> It may have been a couple of weeks since we've sung it, but again, this is another one that's pretty easy to learn. So sing on, sing on out, please. <clears throat> the first 60 or so songs in our book are all from the book of Psalms, the derivatives of Psalms. We're going to learn one of those tonight. It's number 30. It's called, Hear, O Lord. I'd like to ask how many of you know this song. Let me just show you the beginning of it here. I can maybe sing the first little bit. <clears throat> you can go ahead and sort of, oh yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll just sing a second. Hear, O Lord, and answer, I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. How many of you know that song? Okay, a few. And that's good. <laughs> it's always, a, they're all over here. <laughs> but that's good. Um, so a couple things about this song that make it very easy to learn. Uh, one, in the beginning, everyone's in unison in these two lines. Every, every voice is singing the same notes. Um, so let's just sing the first two slides together. Mm. Hear, O Lord, and answer, I am poor and needy. Pardon my life, for I am devoted to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and my cry for mercy. In this day of trouble, I will call to you. All right, so a very simple tune, and everyone is singing in unison. And there's something nice about singing in unison, I, th I think. Some, we don't do that very often, but there is 
may be redundant to say, there's great unity in singing in unison, and there's something about that that I think that can be very, that can be very helpful. So the, the next slide, uh, the men you sing, did I go backwards? I did. Men, you sing exactly what we just sang. Hear, O Lord, and answer. See that? It's exactly the same thing. I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. I was going to do this myself. I think I just turned it off. Just a second. There we are. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and my cry for mercy. In this day of trouble, I'll call to you. So it's exactly the same thing, guys, that you just sang. So nothing new there. Women, it's a little different. Hear, O Lord, answer my prayer, guard my life, for I am yours. Hear my prayer, Lord, and my cry, in trouble I will call to you. So it's not complicated, and all the women are in unison. So if someone near you, know, near you knows it, you're safe. <laughs> You've got it. So let's just sing these first four slides together. Guys, I'll let you click through those. The first four slides together. Make sure we're still on the key here. Mm-hmm. Hear, O Lord, and answer, I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and my cry for mercy. In this day of trouble, The next section, then, um, I'll just take it from here. There you are. Again, we're back to all in unison. No, we're not all in unison. We're not all in unison. The, men, the, the women still are in unison, though, and all the guys are in unison. In fact, all the guys sing together and sing the same part until the very end, the very last two slides. Same thing with the women. The women are all in unison together until the last two slides. There's a little bit of harmony here, but the women are singing one part, men singing another part. Women, your lead is... I will praise you, I will praise you, glorify your name, O Lord. I will praise you, I will praise you, glorify your name, O Lord. And men, you're just seeing a very simple harmony aside, alongside that. Let's just do these two slides. Uh, these, yeah, these two slides together. Men, there's your note, guys. I'm gonna let you take it, guys. I'm gonna sing with the with the, the lead with the women. And then the next section, guys, you repeat what the, the women just sang. You start on the high D now. Guys are singing, I will praise you, I will praise you. Thank you. <laughs> Glorify your name, O Lord. That's what the guys are singing. Women, you're now singing um, a counter melody, which is a, but you've already sung it. You just sang it. This is the beginning of the song. Hear, O Lord, and answer, I am poor. And so it's nothing new to the women on this part. Does that make sense? All right, we're going to try that one. Men, you take it. Ladies, you're on the hero, Lord. I'm going to let you ladies do it. Guys, I'll sing with you. Mm-hmm. Women, hero, Lord, and answer. Guys, ready? I Thank 
you guys for taking the slide because I put, put the clicker down. And then the very edge, the very end, ends this way. We're back to classic four-part harmony here. Um, and so we'll sing these last two slides, and that's the song. Then we'll back up, and we'll just sing this through once all together. <clears throat> so let's just get our notes here at the end. Mm, bass, mm, alto, soprano. Mm -hmm. I'll sing with the, the lead. Mm, do those two slides again, then we're going to sing the song. Just one slide. When we get to this part at the end, see in the top left corner that there's that MP. If you know music, that means you get modestly soft. So the idea that the song is it's a it's a psalm of help. It's a call for help, right? Hear, O Lord, my life is hard. This, that's what the song is about. In the middle, I will praise you. I will praise you. That it's it's the music is brighter. It's higher. But the song ends with this more almost somber, reflective, hear, O Lord, hear, O Lord, hear, O Lord, my humble prayer. Hear, Lord, answer me. It's one of those psalms. And so when we get to this last part, we'll bring the volume down in a more reflective, sort of somber moment. All right, I think you have this song. I think you have it great. Let's go back to the beginning, and we're just going to sing it straight through. Hear, O Lord, and answer my Lord and needy, cry by my poor eyes, I am devoted to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and my cry for mercy, in this day of trouble I will call to you. First verse of The Lord's My Shepherd. From a song you may have never sang before to one of the ones you may have sang most often. Sing the first verse of this song. 
do soul. The Lord is my shepherd, I us know that the lyrics of this song are taken from the 23rd Psalm. And we're going to end up in that passage in just a few moments. But first, I'd like to take a few minutes to just discuss what the relationship is between a shepherd and its sheep. And to start off, I want to tell you and explain to you everything that I know from a practical, real-life, everyday standpoint about the relationship between a shepherd and a sheep. That's it. I, I, I don't know anything about shepherding sheep. And many of you might think that since I grew up in Arkansas, that I might know a thing or two about farming or livestock or caring for animals or something like that. But the truth is, all I know about this relationship is found in Scripture. And as we consider this song tonight, I want us to consider this relationship. And we need to understand this relationship to know what David is talking about. Well, what do we know about shepherds in the Bible? Assuming you know as much as I do from a practical, everyday standpoint, what do we see in Scripture about sheep and shepherds? Maybe you think about Jesus and the parable of the lost sheep. And the fact that sheep can get uh, separated from their shepherds. And in that particular instance, when the shepherd finds his sheep, he rejoices. Maybe you think about elders being re referred to as shepherds, caring for the souls of a church family or flock of, of Christians. Maybe you think about Abraham, Abraham and Isaac being shepherds. Or in particular, maybe you think about Jacob being told by God to go to Egypt in Genesis 46. And when Joseph meets Jacob, Joseph tells Jacob what to say to Pharaoh in verses 33 and 34 of chapter 46. When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth, even until now. Both we and our fathers that you may live in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is loathsome or an abomination to the Egyptians. Or maybe your mind goes back to Abel in Genesis 4. Maybe you think about the instance in the garden where, or not in the garden, but where Abel offers a sacrifice of the first of his livestock, and he's a shepherd. Maybe you think about Samuel being directed by the Lord to go to Bethlehem to anoint one of the sons of Jesse. And that's found in 1 Samuel 16, and we see this picture of Jesse's sons being called. And Samuel says, is this all, is this all your sons? Jesse says, no, I, I have another one, and he's tending to the sheep. That was the son of David. Or that, that Jesse's son was David, the future king of Israel. I don't know what you think about when it comes to shepherds and sheep, but there are many found in Scripture. And in many of those instances, shepherds weren't looked at as glorious or maybe coveted occupations. They were sometimes lowly and loathsome occupations in that day. So as we consider the song, The Lord's My Shepherd, I want to think about one instance in particular that describes perhaps the best example of a shepherd in all of Scripture. So let's turn to John 10. John chapter 10. And as we turn over there, I want to provide just a brief backdrop of what's happened prior to this in John 10. In John 8, we have this continually contentious relationship between, between Jesus and the Pharisees. With the encounter of Jesus and the, and the adulterous woman. 
And the chapter ends with Jesus in one of his I am statements when describing that before Abraham, I am. And this leads to the Pharisees wanting to try and kill him. In chapter 9, we see Jesus healing the blind man with clay on the Sabbath, nonetheless. And again, at the end of chapter 9, we see more contention between Jesus and the Pharisees as he tells them that since they claim to see, they're in sin. So after the events of John 9, Jesus could have easily said, did you see what I did back there? I healed that blind man with spit and dirt. That wasn't staged. That man's been blind forever. You know it. I know it. It wasn't a staged event. You knew this man. And I opened, his mo- I opened his eyes. And can you believe these guys who they say I am and they don't, they don't know who I am? He doesn't say that. What does he say? Jesus teaches another parable. So let's read this parable together. John 10, beginning in verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus, so Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and not concerned about the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. And I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I might take it again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father. A division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? See here, he doesn't say, look what I did back there. He says two times in this passage in verses 11 and 14, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Now, by saying that he's the good shepherd, this assumes there must be bad shepherds. So what are bad shepherds? Well, Jesus tells us what they are. In verse 11, a good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. A bad shepherd abandons his sheep. In verse 14, a good shepherd knows his sheep and they know him. And again in verse 15, a good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So what can we take from this? A good shepherd, of course, makes sure that his, his sheep are fed and watered and nourished and cared for. But what ultimately is a good shepherd? A good shepherd is willing to die for his sheep. Please listen as I read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. 
Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So not only is Jesus a good shepherd, but he's my shepherd, and he's your shepherd. And he was willing to die for us, his sheep. So as we sing this song, let's consider that Jesus, yes, cares for us and considered us here on this earth as we live. But ultimately, what does a good shepherd do? What was he willing to do for you and do for me? He was willing to die for us. We'll sing all five verses of The Lord is My Shepherd. <clears throat> The Lord is my I was asked to pick a song to talk about tonight. Two immediately came to mind, and the one I chose was one that was my mother's favorite song. In fact, um, she requested it for her funeral, and we sang it at her funeral. And um, I think this song really gave her great comfort in her life, particularly towards the end of her life, and, um, and it means a lot to me as well. 
see. Uh, Oh, there we go. And the song is Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. Um, what I want to do first is just introduce you to the author of this song. And this lady's name was Jenny Bain Wilson. And um, due to some complications she had in early life, she was bound to a wheelchair from age three to her death at age 56. During that time, she wrote over 3,000 hymns, which is pretty impressive. And a lot of the... Um, People, the publishers of the time referred to her as the Fanny J. Crosby of the West. Now, if you don't know who Fanny J. Crosby is, pick up your songbook, start flipping through the pages. You won't go very many pages before you see Fanny J. Crosby. She's throughout the whole thing. In fact, she, um, what I thought was really incredible, which has nothing to do with this song or this, off, this lyricist, but uh, Fanny J. Crosby, she wrote over 8,000 hymns during her lifetime. And while Jenny Wilson was wheelchair bound. Fanny Crosby was, blind. she was blind for almost her entire life. And wrote over 8,000 hymns, and many of which we still sing today, which is pretty incredible. I thought that was pretty impressive. It was, it was um, I, you know, pretty inspirational that most of these women, despite their physical limitations, they spent so much of their lives focused on thinking about and putting into writing spiritual things and. and things about God. And what I wanted to do here with this song is to just go through the lyrics of the song and then just touch on a couple of scriptures and Bible passages that, that um, relate to the, to the lyrics there. So first of all, it's, time is filled with swift transition. Naught of earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. And it just references the brevity of life. Life passes so quickly. I don't think the older that we get, the more we realize that. I know some of you who are older, like me, realize that. Some of you younger ones probably don't get that quite yet. Probably kind of like my six-year-old who, before we came here, she was telling me about something she remembered a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to, you know, in defense of her, you know, two to three years for a six-year-old is like half a lifetime ago. So, um, but uh, I just, I, you know, have to laugh at that because, you know, two or three years ago is like a drop in the bucket. And the, like I said, the older we get, the, the faster life seems to pass. God, on the other hand, is eternal. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the great I Am. And James 4, 14, it says, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Trust in him who will not leave you, whatsoever years may bring, if by earthly friends forsaken, still more closely to him cling. Friends in this life, they come and go, situations change, um, you know, but God never changes He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's our anchor. In Psalms 48, 14, it says, For such is God, our God, forever and ever. He will guide us until death. Covet not this world's vain riches that so rapidly decay. Seek to gain the heavenly treasures. They will never pass away. As we all know, nothing on this earth is permanent. And we aren't taking anything with us when we go. You know, a lot of people say the only things sure in life are death and taxes. Well, I don't know about the taxes part, but death is definitely one of them, and uh, we ain't taking it with us when we're going. So, um, Luke 12, 33 and 34 says, Sell your possessions and give them to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I've missed a slide. <laughs> Because there's another verse in here. Uh, 
Here we go. When your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, fair and bright, the home and glory, your enraptured soul will view. And I think this is one of the things that really comforted my mother in her final days, too. And uh, it's one of the... And, Everything this song says is what she wanted to leave us with, her family, her friends. These are ideas that she wanted us to think about, wanted us to realize this was her life. This was what her life was all about. And 2 Corinthians 5 and 1 says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And then the um, chorus, of course, goes, hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Second Peter 3 a says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And in Hebrews 13, 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this hymn, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand, it focuses on the brevity of life, the temporal nature of things in this world, and the assurance that we find in God's steadfastness. It encourages us to anchor our trust in God amidst life's inevitable changes, to prioritize spiritual values over temporal pursuits, and to put our faith in the unchanging nature of God. Also to look forward to a glorious home in heaven with Him when this life is over. And I know that's where my mother was looking forward to. And uh, I look forward to one day being with her there and um, possibly singing this song with her there. And let's go ahead and sing it with me. Another thing that happens when you get old is your eyesight goes a little bit. Uh, here we go. So. Do, do, mi, so, mi, do. Time.
and thank Matt and Kendall both for their work on those songs tonight and giving us some th things to think about in regards to those songs. We have about five minutes left. Let's sing uh, one more song together, and then we'll take, uh, after the song we'll have a short prayer, and then we'll take a break while the kids come in. When I survey the wondrous cross. This is one of my favorite songs. It's an old one, uh, but the thoughts and the words are simply uh, provocative, and, uh, and the music is appropriate, I think, for what the, the message of the song is singing, what the cross is. When I survey the wondrous cross. <clears throat> Pray briefly, please. Our Father, we are grateful that we get to assemble tonight to sing and to reflect on songs that you directed us to sing to you in worship. It is a gift. And as you have enabled us to use that for our own edification and teaching of one another, as we worship you, we are grateful and we give you all praise and honor. We ask you to work through what we've done tonight to strengthen us, to mature us, to shift our mind where it needs to be shifted to hone edges that are rough, that need to be made smooth, to open up perspectives to which we have been closed, to change us to be more like Christ. In His name, amen. We'll take a break.